This program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Biblical Life TV. Deep waters to nurture and empower the remnant for the last days. There is a power that is about ready to be released from heaven to those that seek after the things of the kingdom of God. When it comes to the Word of God, there is a supernatural unction of the Holy Spirit to learn. God is up to something for those that will study to show yourself approved. Right now there's a lot of things in the kingdom that God is trying to establish that goes against people's theology. You need to understand your roots, where you came from. God may require us to change what we're doing to make walking in the kingdom a higher priority than it ever was before. We were never called to have a little light. We were called to be ablaze with the fire of God in this generation. Join the remnant from around the world who are empowered by the Word of God to fulfill God's purpose in these last days. God is speaking something different. That is going to be essential in the days ahead. And that's part of this anointing that we have to have. Prepare yourselves for spirit-filled teaching. Biblical Life TV. You know, we're in the middle of the fall feast. We're doing this a little early this year because I've got to be in Tennessee during Tabernacles. And the fall feast, I'm finding more applicable with every day, okay? You know, one of the things as the Day of Atonement approaches, and this is one that goes by the calendar, I, I look back and I feel robbed at all the years. I went right by the Feast or the, the Day of Atonement and didn't even know it existed. And the spiritual, you know, uh, the significance of it that all these years there is a feast that basically we're rehearsing Jesus coming back and koshering this planet and judging the earth. And while I was in churches that taught end time prophecy, none of them ever did the Day of Atonement. Never even connected it as far as I remember with it. And one of the aspects of it that really cries out to me is having a creator. You know, the world doesn't like that. They would rather aliens be our creators than Almighty God. It's called panspermia. They've, uh, they've decided that there has not been enough time since time began to, for, for evolution to work. I guess there's not been enough billions and billions of years for it to work and so somebody had to stop by on their little on their little scientific laboratory bus and throw some seed out there for us to evolve into humans but then we have another conundrum how did they evolve if there wasn't enough time for us there wasn't enough time for them but that's logical let's not bring that up you know the atheist screams that there is no creator, there is no God, but he refuses the fact that one day that he will stand before the creator to give an account. That's the reason they are so vehement in their cry that there's no God. The communist screams there is no creator, while through brutality and iniquity attempt to create a utopia without God. The transhumanist screams that there is no creator, Yet he attempts to create his own artificial God through the singularity and transcend his humanity by becoming something other that is eternal and beyond God's authority. Well, you know what? It all started out with his dirt. And if it started out with his dirt, he has authority over it, but they've, they've forgotten that. We're seeing this race toward a one-world government. We're seeing this race toward stripping every citizen except the most rich and well-placed families to have any rights whatsoever. You know, I was appalled. I was listening to one show and they were out just on, on the streets just interviewing citizens, you know, about, you know, what should we do about the, you know, should we have the, the vaccination passport? You know, we're literally going to have Nazis on the streets saying, papers please, you know. And they interviewed this one guy 
And he said, I, I, I think they should have that. I, I, I think that they should have, you know, a, a designator on if you're not vaccinated. And the guy said, yeah, like something yellow? Yeah, like something yellow. And he said, how about concentration camps? Yeah, 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 yeah. The guy was Jewish. Fear turns off your brain. You see, what they're doing before World War II, they had to have a group that they stigmatized and said, it's all your fault. In that case, it was the Jew. Now it's going to be the unvaccinated. In fact, they literally had yellow stickers in, in the UK they were putting on people of any color available in the spectrum they had to use yellow. Yellow stars are going to start showing up again or yellow crosses or yellow something by a bunch of yellow bellies. Yeah. And I know I'm just... <laughs> There's a lot of stuff I want to share. And you know what? I don't, I don't care about censors anymore. I'm an American. I have something called the First Amendment. And you know what? If you don't want our stuff on there... We'll, have, we'll, we'll find a platform that does, and we'll leave you in mass. Amen. We're finding out the ones that we need to be fearful of are those that have been vaccinated, and they won't tell you that the number one group that's resisting it are people with advanced degrees in medicine and science. And we see, and in fact, just... On, on television there, they had the things about the, uh, the breakout up in Springfield and how that the medical staff were being worked to death. And what they didn't tell you is that half of them walked out so they wouldn't be vaccinated. So you have half the staff having to work 12-hour shifts three days a week. Yeah, they're being, because doctors are leaving this stuff in herds, guys. So what all this what is the the day of atonement teaches us two things. My God, we need redemption. We need it bad. The global reset that I'm looking for is the world to get stuck off of stupid. And we need to have God's intervention and his divine judgment. And you know what can happen at all at the same time? Do you know that it happened in Egypt all at the same time God was redeeming while God was judging? And we're going to find out here in a little bit as we get into some things that the, uh, the, the harpazo of the church may be closer to the end. And I tell my friends that are pre-tribbers, I say, if you're right, I will give you a high five as we go through the clouds. But I'm prepared. and I'm, The Bible says two things. It says, blessed is he who holds out to the end, okay? So I'm holding out to the end. But I also discovered, and, and we need to realize this because all of us are trying to, you know, what year is the Lord coming back? You know, that, that we, we, we have the, the meteorite or the asteroid that Tom Horn's talking about this. We have this, that, and the other. Will it be th 2030, 2035? Did you know that there is not a single blessing given for anybody who gets the year right in the Word of God? The blessing comes that if it's 2090 or 2190, those that are found faithful and hold out to the end shall be saved. We keep on looking for the finish line instead of being faithful in the journey. And we want to argue with each other about where the finish line is. Do you ever notice that? Have you ever seen the Olympics? that they stop and argue about where the finish line is. And if they ever did that, the guy that keeps running, running, running wins. Boy, that's hard to say. I don't want to argue about it. I want to be about the race. And each year during this time, I'll always deal with some type of aspect of repentance. Because you've you got to put all the words in the Hebrew and the Greek together to get a really a good understanding of repentance. We have dealt from everything from being sorry for our sins, which is not equal being sorry that we got caught. Okay? 
all the way to a need to return back to the ways of God. You got to put it all together to truly repent. But I found today a form of repentance that we should never do. And everybody goes, what? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 6. And it's going on a lot in the church, and uh, I've seen it a lot in politics. Now I've really got your interest going on. Okay. Now God is calling out both Israel and Judah for playing the harlot. Now let me, can I, can I add something into here? They had their own holidays and their own activities that when they did them, they either brought them into the feast of God or they did them separately that God called them being whores over. Did the cross change that? No. Wake up call. Okay. Have you found verse 6 yet? And the Lord also said to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and has played the harlot. And I said after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I said, for all the causes for this, what the, which uh, backsliding Israel has committed adultery, I will put her away and had given her a certificate of divorce. Do you know God's divorced? Don't tell the Baptist. <laughs> Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. And so it came to pass through her casual harlotry, Casual. She, that word means they didn't think it was a big thing. Yeah, but it's my holiday. Don't take my blank. Casual thing. God didn't think it was so casual, did he? That she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees... And yet for all of this, her treacherous sister Judah did not turn to me with her whole heart, but in pretense. Underline that in your Bible, with pretense. Says the Lord, Then the Lord said to me, Backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. That got my attention. Israel just kept on doing it and wouldn't, and wouldn't turn, wouldn't even give any pretense to it, just, just kept on going their way. And Judah tried to fake it, you know, rend their clothes, oh, 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 and then went back right to what they were doing. God said that Israel didn't pretend to repent. You know, it's like a politician that gets caught. No, I'm sorry that I got caught. Now I know what to cover so that you won't find out next time. We see this all the time. Pretense has, I looked up some synonyms for pretense, deception and subterfuge. Deception. The half-hearted, deceptive form of repentance that believers, and we as believers must resist and run from at all cost because this type of fake repentance is self-deception which I think also just includes being moved emotionally how many people have we seen got saved at a sad story about old yeller dying even though he didn't know the day nor the hour but he died. The dog died. He didn't know he was not going to live tomorrow. And he died for little Billy. Won't you come? We, we, um, we do an emotional pill. Now there's, there's emotion with it. But I, I like what Charles Finney used to do. He said, I would come as the prosecuting attorney. And I would plead God's case before the congregation. 
And I would plead it to the place that they could not come up with any other verdict but guilty. And it drove them to the altar. Our desire for numbers so that we can, you know, be like the the old six-shooter, you know, the, the old cowboy that had the notches, you know, in his gun or in his belt. We're getting pseudo-salvations. We're getting pseudo-repentance. We're getting pseudo because there is no tugging of the Holy Spirit. In fact, one of the things that alarmed me today, I was reading in, in the Christian Post, is reporting that the majority of believers do not even believe there's such a thing as the Holy Spirit. You know why? You have grieved him and he's been away from you so long that you don't even know he exists. I know that there's a Holy Spirit. Okay. Now let's let's just not stop there. I want to keep reading, picking back up here in verse 12. He said, And go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return backsliding Israel, says the Lord. And I will not cause my anger to fall on you, for I am merciful, says the Lord. And I will not remain angry forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity and that you have transgressed against the Lord your God. And have scattered your charms to alien deities under every green tree. And that you have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. Return, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. So now he's talking to Judah. And I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and will bring you to Zion. And I will give you shepherds according to your heart. There's a principle found in this. Everybody's griping about poor shepherds. One's not teaching truth. It's because when the church begins to turn away from truth, it creates a vacuum that will be, that will be filled by shepherds that will preach untruth. The Apostle Paul said, there'll be teachers that know how to just tickle your ears just the way they like to be tickled. But once we return to God, God promises this. He says, listen, I'm going to give you shepherds who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. If the preaching of the Word only moves you emotionally and does not fill you with knowledge and understanding of how to walk with God and understanding the kingdom, then you're not being shepherded. Just want to put that into place. Because with the days that, we, that we're, we're, we're coming to, we need to be filled with understanding. We need to be filled with knowledge. We need to cast off the charms of the pagan gods. I read another article this morning that said that, Jude, that Judah, now it's, it's interesting they didn't say Christians, they were saying the Jews need to understand that there's other gods. There really are other gods. Because it's in preparation for the old gods to return. There's everything that's going on. And unless you realize that, you're going to be ill-prepared for it. That we're going to see manifestations of Apollo and Zeus and others. Supernatural. They may come in physical bodies and do Herculean events to prove how wonderful human 2.0 can be. That they have become Nietzsche's new man that has transcended good and evil. I remember reading Nietzsche and I thought Nietzsche and Aliester Crowley would have really gotten along together very well. One says, do as thou wilt as the whole of the law. And the other one says, when the Ubermensch shows up, whatever he does becomes law. Because it's right, because he did it, he transcends. Let me tell you something, you cannot transcend the law of God. Lucifer himself cannot transcend the law of God. And one day he will have to give an answer before the throne of God. Now as I was examining and pondering all these things, I'm saying, Lord, where are we really? Where, where, where in, this, in this prophetic moment in the last days, where, where are we? And God took me to the book of Malachi. 
Because we, we saw, because I'm going to kind of contrast here, we saw half-hearted repentance and how God hates that. They, they did it for show. And I want to start here in verse number 16. I love the book of Malachi. Now, here's the contrasting. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. What were they speaking to one another about? How we should be reverencing God. They spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. That at this time in history, that was not only was it a rare thing to hear about the fear of God, but for those that really feared him to talk among themselves of the how that we need to return to our reverence for Almighty God and how the church has lost it. And it was such an event that God says, wait a minute guys, i got to write this down. God pulls out his diary and says, I've got to write this down. This is a landmark event. With seeing what's going on in the world today, would you reckon if believers begin talking about our need for the fear of God and learning how to press and to learn into the fear of God is not something that heaven would take note of? It's a rare thing. When was the last time that we heard many preachers even mention the fear of the Lord? In fact, I recently read a post about that, and the number one comment that was done is, the only time that we hear about the fear of the Lord is about tithing and when the offering plate's passed around. How many know the fear of the Lord's got to go beyond the offering plate? But I love what it says here, God listened and he heard. Contrast that with repentance of pretense. He listened, but when he tried to listen to their heart, there was no connection. He heard their words, he listened to the words, but he heard their hearts. The remnant in this generation are beginning to hunger for the fear of God. We're not saying that we have arrived we are, we are awakening to its need. And I'm also beginning to, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of Christian stuff that I've turned off because there's no fear of God in it. It's, it's almost this casual, we, we've got this casualness with God that is showing up in the preaching and the teaching that's frightening to me. And... The older I get, the more frightening it's, it's becoming. A, you know, there, there's something as you start to get older. You know, when you're younger, I'm going to live forever. And Man, I remember when I was younger, I was writing checks that right now my body's having a hard time paying for in my 60s. You know what I mean? Every injury that you thought you got over, it begins complaining to you when you get older. And it's all kinds of different things. But... Young people are not taught the fear of God. In fact, today, they have no fear of anything. It's narcissism and overdrive. I was listening to one conservative commentator who says, cancel culture and getting offended when somebody has a different opinion than you is the supreme expression of narcissism. How dare they? You're offended because they don't agree with you, whether you're right or wrong. And it's this spirit of self, this spirit of antichrist that's fueling all of this. Whereas a true believer, our first thought needs to be, how does this affect God? How does this affect his name? How does this affect his reputation? Come on, it's, 
one of God's top ten. Do not take my, the, the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And that does not mean using it as a curse word, which you shouldn't use, by the way, either. But it means by the way that you live, that you ruin the family reputation. And what Christians have historically done has ruined the Father's reputation. You see, what I want and what I think is going to cause the great revival is not some sound being released or not some physically seeing fire being released. It's when God's people start walking so much in the fear of God that we make his name begin to be reverenced by those around us because they're seeing and they're being affected by the way that we live. And it is in such contrast to the garbage that's going on in the world. They're going to hunger for Jesus. How rare is this that God had to write it down in the book? Well, Genesis 6, 5, and 6. Remember Jesus said it was going to be in the days of Noah? And it's not just talking about the Nephilim. I mean, no, Nephilim are bad. Especially when you get into the pre-flood ones, which were 48 feet tall, or higher they were, the, Joshua said they were as high as a cedar tree after the flood. They started getting down. Uh, Goliath was a midget by the time we get to him. Well, if they were 48 feet after the flood, they were much higher. And some estimate hundreds of feet tall when they got fully grown. And it was so bad that if the ground, if the land could not produce enough food, then they just began eating people. Oh, they wouldn't do that. Fee, fi, fo, fum. It's even, it's even done in some of our nursery, uh, our, that understanding of what goes on. But the part that we, we forget about, starting in verse 5 of Genesis 6, And then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. It sounds like that God went to a Devos conference. Or maybe builder burgers or some Illuminati meeting. Or maybe just visited Washington for all I know. But we're returning there. And in our universities, it is hard to go to university today and come out having any integrity left, any morality left whatsoever. And my question is, if we're a Christian, why are we funding these things by sending our kids to them? That's a whole other ball of wax. Contrast Genesis 6 with Malachi 3. One, hearts are only continually evil. How can I get mine? And how can I stab Fred in the back or Billy in the back to get mine? Narcissistic all the way. Jesus said, he who tries to save his life shall lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. Being selfless is the spirit of Christ. Being selfish is the spirit of Antichrist. But now, now God, God hears their words... He writes it down in a book, but let's go on here in Malachi. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. How many know God like those guys? On that day I will make them my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And I read one commentator that said, that is proof of a pre-trib rapture. And if that is the criteria for a pre-trib rapture, six will be leaving on the day the Lord comes back. Because everybody running around with their Willy Wonka golden ticket do not match this category. It's because grace, you've got to put up with me. How many of you ever had that in, in, in the family? You got that one uncle or that one nephew that the whole family hates to see coming. And the greatest relief is when they go home. 
Is that what you want to be in the kingdom of God? Or do you want the Father to say, man, I'm so glad you came to me in prayer today. I was just excited to spend time with you. Mm. Do you know when we're going to see more of a manifestation of the kingdom of God is when the kingdom of God feels more at home with us. God says, listen, I'm going to spare them. Now, let's keep this in context, okay? I think this, this is what, what he's talking about here is the last of the last days. When all men's hearts are turned to evil, including much of what has been called the church. In fact, if a lot of the church does not change, they will have received the mark of the new leader meetings at their churches. Because they're primed for deception. So in the midst of God beginning to move, said, I'm going to write your names down because I'm going to protect you. That you're, a, you're special to me. That I'm going to deliver you as a son that's doing his father's work. Not the rebellious son, but the son that's actually working to maintain the family name. And then he goes on. And he says this in verse 16. And then you shall begin, uh, then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, and between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. How do we separate those that God saves, those that God delivers? When they walk out of situations that the enemy thought that they had them, and they walk out the other side. You know, I think we're entering into a time that the landscape of the church may change greatly. That we may be really surprised with who goes on to their reward and who stays with everything that's going on. And then, we'll, I mean, there's been, there's been, in the last 10 years, how many guys that we thought were like a Moses and doing what they're supposed to be doing? And then after they died, all the dirty dealings and the whatever begins to come up and that was going on the whole time. So it's, it's not unconscionable to think that as God begins to judge, He's going to judge that before He judges the world, since judgment must first begin in the house of God. In the Kingdom Priesthood book, I share about a vision that an evangelist had back in the 1950s. And it was of the church as a sleeping giant, kind of like, you know, Gulliver's Travels, where he's all pinned down, except with the, instead of little people's demons holding him back down every once in a while, he kind of tried to wake up a little bit, and then they'd soothe him back to sleep and tighten the ropes. And then he saw God begin to move, and the church stood up. That is the greatest fear of Washington, D.C. That is the greatest fear of the United Nations. That is the greatest fear of the New World Order is that the church of Jesus Christ stood up and won't be slumbered to sleep anymore or pacified by the things of the world. And God begins to move, and God begins to move in demonstrations of the power of the Spirit of God through healings and deliverance. And he said, as I saw that, he said, there were many people that came to mind that I thought would be on the forefront of what God was doing. And he said they rejected it and just backed up and just disappeared, never to be seen again. He said, God raised up people that were like John the Baptist out in the wilderness. Nobody had ever heard of, but they come out in the fire of Elijah. I think that we're on the precipice of that kind of movement. And what my heart is about is these new guys coming out of the wilderness. I want to make sure they have all the tools necessary to get the job done. Okay? Okay. That as we see the judgment of God, and some people God's going to judge, that we're going to go, what? Until the stuff comes up. 
And there's going to be some people that we thought, man, you're not very camera friendly. You know, I, I, I feel that way every time I edit my own video, I must hurt myself, you know. And, you, you know, you just don't say every word right, and you just don't, uh, you know, the, we go more by presentation than the quality of the suit. See, I'm, I'm violating everything. I'm, it's hot, it's summer, I'm not wearing a suit. I don't have everything written out to where I can just say it just right and work so hard on my elocution because every once in a while the country boy shows up. All these different things. There's too much of me to fill the camera, which is the opposite of what the world says that I should be. And so I don't fill the slot of what a successful minister is supposed to be. But see, that's based on Hollywood. That's based on... Tinseltown, that's based on the world system. I wish, I wish I could get a picture of John the Baptist when he come out of the wilderness. He may have had hair sticking in every single direction. I mean, they called Elijah a wild man. Okay. Well, that isn't camera friendly at all. What have you got to say? Repent! Or Jonah coming out in Nineveh. Not only was his clothes bleached white, but so was his hair, his skin. He had seaweed in places he didn't know seaweed could even get. And these guys are worshiping the fish god Dagon, and this big fish shows up and goes, blah! And he begins his ministry. Not very camera friendly. Because we need to leave all this craziness behind. Or we don't need rock and roll concert during the altar call. That's the old Baptist. You know, how about this quietly singing I surrender all so that when somebody... I, I don't know how many times I've been at the altar praying with people. What's your problem? And I answer back. And so I pray for them. They throw up their hands. I throw up my hands. And everybody thinks we're worshiping God. We're sitting here in frustration. Can you? The Apostle Paul never had these problems. But we've gotten to Hollywood. Guys, when the smoke clears a judgment and we look at left who's standing, it's going to help us discern good and evil, righteous and unrighteous. And I think it's going to kind of freak us out. And here's the other half. So God's delivering. He's teaching us to discern again. And then he goes on to say, and For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all the wicked, the wickedly will stumble, and the day shall, and the day, uh, and the day that is coming shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that will leave neither root nor branch. Doesn't that kind of sound like the book of Revelation? So the people he's talking to that we're fearing God, that he's delivering, are in the tribulation period, in my point of view. What gets them through is having the fear of God in their hearts. And they're watching what God is doing, and it's reestablishing discernment in the body because we have slow blurred the lines. We don't know who's on first anymore. But then he goes on to say, okay, I'm burning, I'm burning up the wicked. Verse 2 of chapter 4, but to you who fear my name, but to you who fear my name, but to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow f fat like the stall-fed calves. So in the midst of God judging in the book of Revelation, he can bless his people and restore his people. 
And there's been manifestations of that, not only throughout history, but like the painting that we have up here. Why did the woman with the issue of blood reach out and touch the zitzi on the outer coat of Jesus? Because she knew he was Messiah, and when Messiah comes, he comes with healing in his wings, and that is known as the wings of the prayer shawl, the wings of the outer coat. And by doing that, she grabbed onto the name of God, the commandments of God are all wrapped together with a blue cord, which is all wrapped up in Messiah. Everything that Messiah is is manifested in that zizchi. And she reached out and she grabbed it. And she said, when you come, there's healing in your wings, and I need your healing. If she could have that then, how much more can we expect it in the days ahead? It's time for us to raise the bar on everything. In fact, here lately, I've been kind of rebuked by the Lord. And, and just learn from my example, don't ever go to God and gripe. And for some reason, that's a lesson every once in a while I forget. And I go to God and, Lord, I'm... Old and I'm fat and tired and hurting and rah, 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 rah. and you're getting ready to make me busier than I've ever been. Why didn't I do this when I was 30 and flexible? <laughs> uh, if, unless you're old, you don't know. The way you used to bend, you can't bend, and the minute you try, you're in trouble. Okay? And you know what his response has been? And I mean, he got after me, and I, I've had to change my prayers because he says, what have you been expecting? Well, I've been expecting to get stiffer and fatter, <laughs> tireder. He said, so you're getting what you're expecting. And about that time, I go, oh, well, duh. Duh. You get what you have faith for. Okay, God, I repent. I'm expecting to get younger. You're going to restore my youth. You're going to restore. I'm going to get as flexible as Gumby. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have energy come back because it's your life in me that I'm old enough to know that I can't do it. That unless it's your life in me and your power in me and your spirit in me, it's not going to get done. And sometimes he's got to remind me of that several times a week because sometimes the old is easier to kick into than believing and expecting for change. But you know, we have a part to play. I like riding on the white horse when he comes back, but you know, you're actually going to have to get off the horse to fulfill the next verse. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be as ash under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, saith the Lord. I mean, that just jumped out on the... I, man! They're going to be destroyed in the brightness of his coming, but nobody ever told me there was going to be a little bit of ground warfare. And that we get to get off our horses... And do a little bit of fighting with glorified bodies. Why is that? Let me show you what human 2.0 is. It's not Nephilim engineered. It's Holy Ghost engineered because now I have become like him. And I have this resurrected body. And it cannot die. It cannot be wounded. It does not get, it does not get tired. Nor will it get fat. Glory to God. So when my father calls me to the table to eat, there will be no counting of calories. And all God's people said, Hallelujah! All right? But he doesn't stop there. He 
says, Now remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I have commanded him and hoard for all of Israel with the statutes and with the judgments. There is a return back to the ways of God. Not the ways of Babylon with a Christian veneer, but the ways of God with Jesus center to every bit of it. Because you can't do it without Jesus. That's what the Zizi was supposed to tell you with that blue cord, that the 613 commandments, nor the name of God, is really the name of God, unless you got that blue cord. Because when you said Jesus, you have said it all. Oh, that will make you happy. So where are we now and what can we expect? And I thought this so apropos to what they're doing worldwide. Boys and girls aren't boys and girls anymore. They're purple penguins. And we can't, you know, you don't know if a he's a he or if a she's a she. And about the time you think you had their pro down, down, they're telling us that it can fluctuate from minute to minute. So, I'm going to get hippie on everybody. Let's just change it all. To, hey, dude. Yeah. It's, it's, it's gotten to the place where it's crazy. You know, you talk to little kids that haven't been indoctrinated. Boys are boys and girls are girls. You find that out of birth, right? Well, let's look at what we see here. He said, I, Behold, I will send you the Elijah the prophet before the, uh, the, the uh, coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. You see, John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. We're also finding that when you study the Essenes, one of the things that they kept was the mantle of Elijah. It was made out of camel's hair, which was a no-no, except for Elijah. And John the Baptist showed up with it. You know what, you want all of Israel taking note of that? You betcha they took note of it. They thought, this guy's Messiah. But the spirit of Elijah is going to be poured out again on the body of Christ. And we're going to have men and women raise up in the spirit of Elijah. And there's going to be some house cleaning that is done. And listen to how, how, what it does. And it says, now, Elijah, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. God, one of the things that God is going to do is he is going to restore the biblical family before God comes back. There is going to be this absolute dichotomy in the world. Biblical family, the fear of God, the blessing of God, the protection of God, the provision of God, and then all the junk and the filth and the hatred and the putridness that the world's offer is going to be completely white and black. Now you choose. God is literally saying, that day I'm going to set before all mankind life and death, blessing and cursing. Now you choose. Is that not a theme that we see written throughout the Word of God? Well, Mike, that's a tall order. Well, I got a big God. And if God can use me, he can use absolutely anybody, okay? Even those that fight with their mic when they're trying to preach. The Day of Atonement, we've got to have everything under the blood. Because it's a divine rehearsal. That when he comes back, what's not under the blood gets cut off. But tabernacling, I'm looking forward to it. People start, keep on telling me, you know, the, Mark, I, I'm all millennialist. I do not believe in the millennial reign. Well, you just got rid of half of the messianic scriptures in the word of God. And don't tell me the garbage that we have been living the last 2,000 years is the millennial reign. If it is, then all, you just voided all the prophecies of the prophets. Nobody is beating swords into plowshares. They're beating everything they got into swords right now. Don't, talk, don't tell me about that. It's not there. But you know, for the remnant, the only thing is the presence of God that we had manifested on the inside becomes manifested in physical form on the outside. 
And for us, it will feel like home. It'll feel like home. But it all starts with the fear of God. And that needs to be our daily prayer, Lord. You know, the Bible says, come and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. It can be taught. It can be taught and it can be caught. You get around those that have the fear of God, it's contagious. And I pray it's more contagious than COVID-19 for a lot of the body. It needs to be caught. It needs to be taught. Because in that is our protection in the days ahead. The fear of the Lord and holiness is going to be paramount for all of us. Oh. You know, I could share stories of how there was, during, before World War II, the bubonic plague erupted in Africa. Do you know there were Christians ministering in it that had no protective gear, that weren't taking any medicine, that had a zero death rate? Freaked out the medical community. Freaked them out bad. It's the ministry of John G. Lake. He even proved. He said, put it on a slide. Put that, because they would die with a, with a foamy froth out of their lungs. And it was teeming with plague. He says, put that on a microscope. Verify that it's alive. Now put it in my hand. And he prayed and he put it back on a microscope. And all of them were dead. You want to talk about a Vaccination. What we need is a vaccination of the fear of God to turn things around. Now, Father, we can try to skirt around our need for true repentance. We can try to skirt around our need even for the fear of God. But, Father, in the days that we're heading, those that try to skirt are going to end up meeting a brick wall. Father, we ask that you would give us hearts to seek you, that you would give us hearts that would realign everything within us to serve your ways and to seek your face and to learn to fear you. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. And Father, it's the beginning of safety in the days ahead. Grant unto your servants, those that have ears to hear and eyes to see. Father, grant us, like Jesus, to walk in the fear of the Lord, we ask. In Jesus' name. In the Shinar Directive, we journey down the Luciferian rabbit hole to discover the matrix of darkness that has engulfed our planet. In the Shirith Imperative, we dug deeper to unearth the power source of hell itself and how the body of Christ can labor to impede its functioning in the earth and lay the groundwork for revival. Now it is time to unveil the mysteries of both the priesthood of the kingdom of God and the priesthood of darkness. Until these mysteries are understood, God's remnant cannot realize their purpose or be released with heaven's power to overcome the agenda of the denizens of the second heaven. The Kingdom Priesthood is a training manual for the remnant to discover their priesthood, their purpose, and their service to Almighty God. In the pages of this remnant manual, you will discover what Adam experienced in the first few moments of life and how those desires were written into the DNA of humanity revelations of what the Almighty meant when he told Adam and Eve to replenish the earth. Who were the first priests of the kingdom of God in the Bible, and who was the first priest of darkness? What was the knowledge of the tree of good and evil offering the first family of humanity? How we all share the same calling as Abel. The reality of the Principality's Wars and how it is influencing the world today. As believers, how we are to function as both a priest and a tabernacle. The real purpose of the fire of God. How to carry the name of God in the earth with dignity and power. How the priesthood is essential for the releasing of end-time warriors in the last days. How to flow in the sevenfold anointing of the Holy Spirit to represent Messiah. The kingdom priesthood is a call for the remnant to receive the fire of God and become the assembly that the gates of hell cannot overcome. Get your copy today at Amazon.com or KingdomIntelligenceBriefing.com. That's Kingdom. Intelligencebriefing.com 
Thank you for watching Biblical Life TV. We hope and pray that today's program edified you in the Word of God. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the Kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of the end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.